Good afternoon and happy Monday, everyone. I'm Dr. Michael Reinhardt, the director of the Brooklyn Initiative to Develop Geriatrics Education, or BRIDGE for short. It's my pleasure to welcome you today for this session on hearing impairment in the elderly, an important clinical entity that affects social and clinical outcomes of our older patients. This lecture is given in support of the activities of our BRIDGE program, and well, as well as the new advanced certificate program in public health geriatrics in our School of Public Health. The Brooklyn Initiative to Develop Geriatrics Education is funded by the Health Resources and Services Administration as part of their Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program. The Bridge Program was developed in partnership between four of the colleges and schools at SUNY Downstate Health Sciences University, including the College of Medicine, College of Nursing, School of Public Health, and School of Health Professions. This truly interprofessional partnership of our colleges and schools is complemented by our outstanding partners in the community, including the New York City Health and Hospitals Kings County, Brownsville Multi-Service Family Health Center, and the Fort Greene Council, and their network of 13 senior centers throughout the borough of Brooklyn. The overall goal of the Bridge Program is to provide the education and support needed for Brooklyn to become an age and dementia-friendly place for our senior neighbors to obtain their health care. It is our pleasure today to welcome Dr. John Weigand to speak on the important topic of hearing impairment in the elderly. Dr. John Weigand is a well-known audiologist who has been serving the Brooklyn community since 1998. He has been Division Chief of Audiology at SUNY Downstate since May of 2000, and is a New York State Registered Hearing Aid Dispenser, proud member of the American Academy of Audiology, and the New York Speech Language Hearing Association, as well as the American Speech Language Hearing Association. He is a native of Queens, New York, and is a graduate of Archbishop, Archbishop Malloy High School and Queens College. After graduating from college, Dr. Wigand excelled at St. John's University, completing his Master's of Arts program and furthered his education by achieving a doctorate in clinical audiology at the University of Florida. Dr. Wigand completed his practicum training at the Manhattan Eye and Ear and Throat Hospital and the Veterans Affairs Medical Center. Prior to earning his New York State audiology and hearing instrument dispensing licenses, Dr. Wigand completed clinical fellowship at the Long Island College Hospital, where he received extensive training in pediatric audiology, including fitting hearing impaired children with hearing devices and collaborating with surgeons in the operating room during cochlear implant procedures. <clears throat> During his career, Dr. Wigand has become an active member of the community. He is an avid speaker and presenter and has provided numerous educational sessions <clears throat> and courses to fellow practitioners and patient groups at various venues. His office offers complimentary hearing screenings throughout the community and has participated at numerous health fairs. He has appeared on several local televised medical programs and submitted articles to local newspapers. Dr. Wigand was previously recognized by the Fort Greene Council for Outstanding Community Service. A great achievement of his is the creation of the resident training for rising audiologists. To date, he has trained over 100 students throughout a variety of clinical settings and has continued to expand community services by providing care at several outside private practice locations. Thank you, Dr. Wigand. We look forward to your talk today. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Reinhardt and Dr. Donovan, for the opportunity to uh, present to all of you today. Okay, I'm Dr. John Wigand, looking forward to uh, presenting this topic to you. Okay, um, so the uh, goal of our pro uh, program today is to demonstrate general knowledge of audiology and the role of healthy hearing in improving quality interdisciplinary care across the care continuum to understand the impact of current events on the audiovestibular system, identify and leverage common audiological misconceptions to aid in the eradication of ageism, subsequently improving patient quality of life and healthcare delivery. Okay, so uh, I feel uh, very lucky to have been a downstate for over 21 years and treated over 50,000 patients uh, during my time, but I cannot do it alone, so I want to acknowledge the team of professionals that works with me that help uh, our office and our practice run at a very high level. Um, Dr. Anastasia Golden, Dr. Monica Skarzynski, Dr. Megan Weiner, Dr. Kirsten Clifton. Uh, these are all of the uh, audiologists that I count on and collaborate with on a daily basis, as well as, um, very importantly, uh, Ms. Tamika Thomas and Mr. David Tonkowicz. These are practice managers that are keeping everything running behind the scenes 
And we also have six audiology residents from various universities that we are training for what's known as their fourth year. It's a uh, final year of clinical training. Okay, so um, an audiologist is a healthcare provider who provides patient-centered care in the prevention, identification, diagnosis, and evidence-based treatment of hearing, balance, and other auditory disorders for all ages. We navigate complex medical, psychological, physical, social, educational, and occupational needs. We maintain knowledge of existing and emerging technologies, current research, and interpersonal counseling skills. Our role in healthcare is that we help change the course of cognitive decline for patients, reduce the risk of falls, promote education, literacy, and employment, prevent social isolation and loneliness, decrease depression and anxiety, decrease medically adverse events, hospitalizations, and readmissions, and this is estimated to save the healthcare system over $3 billion every year. Um, anatomy of the ear, uh, on the um, outer ear, okay, uh, shown in the slide here is the ear flap. That is the portion that's visible externally. When we look in the ear, we see the ear canal, uh, where we see earwax. Sometimes the end of the ear canal is the eardrum. When sound uh, touches the eardrum or stimulates the eardrum, it vibrates, creating a chain reaction to the ossicles. Those are the three smallest bones in the body. And they, in turn, send a uh, fluid pressure wave through the cochlea. That's the organ of hearing. And ultimately, the stimulation of the hair cells inside of the cochlea sends information to the nerve of hearing that goes up to the brain. The other part of the inner ear is uh, the three semicircular canals, okay, and those make up the vestibular portion of the inner ear. Okay, so uh, fun fact, the three ossicles, if they were uh, placed on the seat of an orange, all three of them at the same time would fit on that orange seat. So it just gives us perspective as how small those structures are and um, really how amazing it is that such a small structure within the body can give us so much and really uh, work as a very uh, important component of the sense of hearing. Um, statistically, uh, the incidence of hearing loss for every thousand babies that's born, um, about two or three of them have some level of measurable hearing loss. 90% of deaf children are born to hearing parents. 15% of Americans age 18 and up report some degree or some trouble with hearing. That's over 37 million people. Age is the strongest predictor of hearing loss, and the um, decade in the, in the 60s, age 60 to 69, has the most people with measurable hearing loss in it uh, presently. 2% of adults age 45 to 54 have disabling hearing loss, and this rate increases uh, for adults age 55 to 64. Okay, um, risk factors for hearing loss um, are age, family hearing loss or genetics, noise exposure, certain medications like aminoglycosides and um, some of the chemotherapy medications. Diabetes and hypertension have a negative effect on the hearing system because these diseases interrupt the blood supply in the microvascular system of the cochlea. And men tend to have a higher incidence of hearing loss than women. Um, primarily because of occupational and potentially military noise exposure. Okay, some comorbidities of hearing loss are dizziness and vertigo, tinnitus and hyperacusis. Some psychiatric conditions associated with hearing loss are depression, anxiety, and loneliness, as well as cognitive decline and dementia. Uh, loneliness um, is really being looked at as its own health condition. Um, Dr. Murthy, who was the former general, uh, Surgeon General under the Obama administration, has published uh, some well-regarded research in this area. Um, from his research, um, we see that 35% of adults over the age of 45 report some level of loneliness. Uh, this is a risk factor for premature death, and statistically it can be as harmful as smoking 15 cigarettes on a daily basis. Um, basic human needs are water, food, and people. Okay, of course, we need water and food to sustain our bodies. We need people to sustain ourselves emotionally. Okay, it's the human connection 
um, in many times, difficult times, that really keeps us going, okay, knowing that someone is looking out for us, someone that we have to look out for, that's uh, quite often what keeps us waking up in the morning. If someone loses that connection to people because of loneliness, it increases their underlying level of stress. Um, increased stress at a baseline uh, can produce cortisol. That's a stress hormone. And if the person experiencing this has an increased level of baseline cortisol, it can lead to other health problems. Um, for example, the reduced perception of pain, increased blood pressure, which can um, increase the heart rate, and then increased blood sugar as well, which leads to more inflammation, higher risk of cancer, uh, diabetes, and high blood pressure. Okay, so loneliness leads to potentially other health problems. Um, the effect of cortisol on the brain, uh, cortisol is affected by uh, or activated by the sympathetic nervous system, that's the fight or flight nervous system. Uh, chronic increases in cortisol affect the prefrontal section of the brain. That's the part of the brain that gives us filters and judgment. Okay, so people in this category may seem persistently aggressive and distrustful. They may be perceived as not being fun to be around and less attractive as social partners. And then it's a spiral effect, right? So loneliness begets loneliness. Um, perhaps reduced social interaction is associated with dementia. And then the lower social interaction means that the brain is tasked less. So there's less cognitive tasking happening uh, in someone with loneliness, okay? Um, loneliness as a medical condition. So what happens to the brain leading to neuronal cell death and dementia? Um, there are MRIs that have shown that adults with loneliness have decreased brain volume, and there are several hypotheses to this. The damage from cortisol and frequent hypertension ultimately damage brain cells. Perhaps lower social interaction and reduced cognitive activity lead to physical changes in the brain. Um, for people with hearing loss, it's hypothesized that distorted sound and reduced access to sound uh, uh, because of that hearing loss leads to physical changes. It's estimated that 20% of people with untreated hearing loss uh, report loneliness. Okay, so uh, Duzel published a study back in 2019 that looked at brain volume and was able to establish objectively that the uh, size of the brain changes with chronic loneliness. Um, different causes of loneliness, some are reversible and some are non-reversible. Okay, looking at the non-reversible first is age, of course. Uh, being female, women have a longer life expectancy than men, so men pass on first, leave the women behind, leading to loneliness. Living in a rural area, just not having people around can lead to loneliness. Lower education, poor health status, and then, of course, uh, being in quarantine. Reversible causes of loneliness, um, can be uh, decreased vision and decreased hearing. So if someone has a problem with vision, quite often it can be treated with corrective lenses or eye surgery or medication. Uh, with hearing, okay, decreased hearing can be treated medically. Perhaps it's just simple earwax. Perhaps a person needs surgery to regain hearing. Perhaps they need a device like a hearing aid or a cochlear implant. But in most cases, there's something that can, can, be, done, can be done. So it's important to keep in mind that it's our brain that hears, not our ears, okay? Hearing serves many purposes. It keeps us safe, gives us environmental awareness. It helps us localize the direction of sounds, and then also helps us to understand speech in noisy backgrounds.